Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We are coming to you from the SEI National Convention. It's We're celebrating 50 years this week. And I am with two incredible women, Shea Gridonis. How do I say this? Again? Gridonis. Shea Gridonis and Hannah Finley. Both of you ladies are being recognized tonight for the U- Young Hunter Award. And this is such an accomplishment that you know both of you um, have earned, and rightfully so. So tell everybody that's listening and watching a little bit about what goes into the process of applying for the Young Hunter Award. So you definitely have to share a lot of your experience with hunting and what that means to you. Mm-hmm. And then you actually write an essay about what it means to be a role model to hunting. And that was my favorite part because I think that is the most meaningful part to me. And there's also some other things like that you want to share. share. Yeah, um, it's a pretty thorough, extensive um, application. We get letters of recommendation from our school, from um, an SCI representative, and um, of course, SCI goes back and looks through our hunting history, what we have accomplished, um, but also community service, our involvement, what we've done to help this organization and others. So it's a very well-rounded um, application that. Uh, we got selected for this year, which is so fun. <laughs> Hold on a second. Perfect. Before you talk, I want to pull this around over here, and then I want to take yours and move it more like that. There we go. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, my love. All right. No, it's good. It's fine. Yeah, we can run. So some of the things that are required for the Young Hunter Award recipients is that you have to be a current SCI member, and both of you have been incredible stewards to the organization and exhibited extraordinary leadership skills you you know you have the essay also um, your hunting history all plays a part of it and then also you have to have actually a letter of recommendation from an SEI chapter and also a letter of recommendation from a school administrator of some kind so both of you have extraordinary academic histories um, Hannah share everybody like a little bit about how you know you went through school with a 4.0 and have done some awesome things with that I've been very, very blessed and I have worked very, very hard. I have very, always been very, very passionate about learning, whether it be hunting or just academics in general. I want to know everything. I want to learn mm-hmm. and I want to grow and it's something that I hold near and dear to my heart. So I actually, actually went through high school in three years with a 4.0 GPA and I was also hunting every weekend and being outdoors as much as I could and playing sports and it was just everything to me to do the best that I could and to be the best that I could and I attended Northern Arizona University on a full tuition scholarship which was so lucky and so much fun and I just recently graduated in May summa cum laude and I'm so proud of that I've kept up a 4.0 GPA all through high school and all through college and while working full time yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) and hunting oh yeah so all of my free time was pretty much spent being outdoors or working and I have no complaints I'm very proud of that and I've worked very very hard to be here so and Shay, you, you as well, you have an extraordinary academic record, but also a great leadership record in FFA. You've done a ton with FFA. Yeah, FFA going through high school, I think was what, um, it gave me a lot of motivation to go out and try new things that I had never imagined myself trying. And um, hopefully my speech tonight goes great, and I would give the credit to that, to the things that I learned in FFA, whether I was in speaking competitions or um, on my officer team leading my chapter and leading my peers or acting as um, a voting delegate in our state convention. FFA gave me opportunities that I didn't think as a high school person I would be able to be experiencing and I think it's real life stuff too that I'm going to be using later on. Completely. So both of you girls we've established that you're extraordinary on the academic side 
both of you are extraordinary hunters as well. Now, Hannah, you grew up with a hunting background. You grew up on the Arizona Strip. Your dad is a game warden, so you got to really experience some cool stuff from, from the time you were really little. Yeah, I've been absolutely blessed. My dad has just been my rock and he has taught me everything I know. I owe everything to him. I owe all of my knowledge to him and I'm very, very, very grateful to have him in my life. And all of those mountainside memories and those mornings glassing up mule deer with him, those are what shaped me. He is everything. So I'm, I'm very, very blessed on that front. I got to live in some of the most incredible elk country, mule deer country. and. Despite all that, I still, for a while in my life, wasn't sure if I was going to be a hunter mm -hmm. because I didn't know any other women that hunted. And my dad always told me, he said, I'll be here for you if you're ever ready. And when you're ready, you let me know and mm -hmm. I will be here to take you out and teach you everything. And he never pushed it on me and I th I'm grateful for that because I know if he did, I might have been a little bit more hesitant, but I'm, I'm very, very blessed and I have had the privilege to do some amazing things, but even more amazing so with my dad. Mm -hmm. Now, Shay, you have kind of a completely different story. Your family is almost like adult onset hunters. Now, your grandfather is a, an incredibly accomplished hunter and is somebody you've always looked up to. He's, he's won the World Hunting Ring um, and, and it's one of the most prestigious awards in hunting and conservation that Safari Club awards. So that was kind of always, you know, that, um, that example for you but what brought your entire family into hunting at such you know kind of a late time in your life with that example you know it's just kind of a funny thing um how it started my grandpa i mean he always hunted from the time that he started learning hunting just out of high school mm -hmm. um with some of his friends like obviously until now like he's he's still going hard and he is my biggest inspiration and in, mm -hmm. in life and hunting and everything and um my hunting career actually started kind of funny um my grandpa gave my cousin the opportunity when she graduated high school to go on any trip that she wanted mm -hmm. and he was expecting like a, let's go to italy on a girl's trip and like touristy things and she said no i want to go hunting in africa and that was my family's opportunity to jump on and say like okay that sounds fun we're gonna go too and so originally it was just me and my dad um, and my brother who were going out my mom was sort of like yeah I'll just take the pictures and then I think when you live so close knit like with your family and we're all really good friends in my family too and you watch everyone else having a really fun time mm -hmm. you kind of want to do that too yeah and so I think over time my cousins my mom um, the other people in my family who were just the picture takers at the beginning mm -hmm saw us having a blast and was like, okay, now I want some of that too. Mm -hmm. And so over time we just sort of gradually developed into it. And now I've got an entire family who all participate in hunting and which honestly is just the best thing ever. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure Hannah <laughs> would also second that. Hannah, what's, what was your first hunt and how old were you when you decided, okay, I've watched my dad, I've, I've hung out with him, I, I know the jam, I'm ready to do this for myself. What was your first experience? What's funny is I was totally surrounded about it, around it, surrounded by it my whole life. Even my dad would GPS sheds and walk us in there. And even when we were little kids, we thought we were the world's best shed hunters, even though we really did. <laughs> Thank we're, you, Dad. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. awesome. Talk, talk about setting that up. Say, well, and look, think about that, though. He set you up as a father to have a really positive outdoor experience, to make it fun for you. He didn't take you on like a 20 mile death march where you found no sheds and you're like, I don't ever want to go back and do that again. <laughs> he was smart about it. Yeah, absolutely. He introduced you in a way that would, would lend itself to, to you having the desire to go back out and do it again. So you can't replace that. No, no not <laughs> at fantastic. all. I, I've been so lucky because my whole life I've been molded into a hunter without realizing that that's what was happening and when it actually came time and I was ready for it I knew so much stuff that most people that aren't blessed enough to know and a lot of people that start off aren't able to have those opportunities so I got really lucky with that but I finally felt like I was ready even though I had been surrounded by it and I'd been bear hunting and I'd been duck hunting and I'd seen all that stuff I just hadn't done it for myself and mm -hmm. I knew I was ready and I, I went small game hunting with my dad I believe I was eight or so got out shot some squirrels just had the time of my life and smiled a whole lot and had so much fun and 
as soon as I started it and spent that day with my dad and got to be outdoors, I knew that this is it. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm passionate about. And I have never turned back since. This is everything to me. There's kids in the Midwest that I know that they start out also squirrel hunting. And it's actually like a thing. And there's there's a local community in Indiana that I'm near and dear to in the Bloomington area and they actually do like squirrel competitions where the kids compete on who harvests the most squirrels and they may <laughs> do a big squirrel cook and they actually cook the squirrels like little maybe like their legs are like little baby chicken legs yeah. <laughs> and they do a squirrel cook and it's it's a really fun way to get kids why does that sound so fun oh my goodness I want to do that yeah. I know right and I need not, to set that up yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody wants to be a part of this it's it's a tremendous way to get kids hunting and a lot of people overlook the simple steps that you can take like literally in your own backyard or in your own community to you know spike the curiosity and and gain the involvement of children in hunting it doesn't have to be a big elk hunt or a mule deer hunt no like you yeah. said it can start as small as squirrel hunting and when it comes to stuff like this i think the little things are the biggest things and mm -hmm. you don't always realize it until you look back on it but just those little things mm -hmm. like walking in and telling me what what plant that is and mule deer eat that and walk me in and let me find a shed and, and really being like hey I think there's one right here this is a really good place to look yeah. but I felt like I was really good and it definitely sparked a fire inside of me that has grown and only will grow from here absolutely hey I'm Christy Titus and for the past several years I've really come to rely on on X hunt for mapping both in and out of the field but now I'm also using it to plan and research units for my application season. Onyx has teamed up with TopRet to show you everything that you need for draw odds in most of the Western states. And access to TopRet services is completely free to all elite members. I now have both the power of Onyx Hunt and TopRet to help me strategize my state hunting applications. If you haven't already, download Onyx Hunt and upgrade to the Elite membership to access Top Rut as well as other great Elite benefits. Now, Shay, you had said in some of our conversations that traveling has changed fundamentally who you are. Explain to everybody what you mean by that, because you're you're so young, and, and I look at you and I'm like, oh, this girl is, you know, you're you're still a young lady, and you're, so much of what you're doing is forming who you're going to be as you go into adulthood. Not that you're not adult, but later in life. Yeah. How how did travel really change your view of the world? You know, for a long time, I thought this was a really hard thing to explain, which it still kind of is. Um, I'll do my best, but well, hunting, it's. It's hunting, right? So you, it's the pursuit of going out and chasing an animal and um, trying to conquer that landscape and conquer that new country and that new experience. But what it does is it takes you to places that really if you weren't out hunting, you wouldn't think about going to. Mm -hmm. Or you wouldn't just come to your mind like, mm -hmm. okay, let's go check out this tiny little town in the middle of Spain that like no one's ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And when you get there, you see a people that very few people where you're from have never interacted with. Yeah. You see a culture that is brand new. You see landscapes and a whole, it seems like a whole new world mm -hmm. that very few people get to yeah. experience. And not only does it give you like that cultural um, acknowledgement and that just globalized view of life, but when you come back home from those experiences and those new journeys, it gives you a perspective of your own life mm -hmm. that you were living beforehand in a completely new, wo new way. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it really impacts you in, in ways that you wouldn't even initially think about. So, I mean, when you're out in the middle of Alaska for two weeks living out of a backpack and you come home and you take a shower, like there's a whole new you're appreciation like, for the shower. Jesus. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, even the simple things, like yeah. it, that just blows your mind, um, giving you that perspective and even taking you back to, I know as hunters, we think about like our primal roots, right? Mm -hmm. And we go back and, it's a new part of you that you get to unleash as well. And um, as an 18 year old going through the modern world, there's a lot of 
contradicting views and a lot of people trying to tell you what to and what not to think. Yeah. But when you get to release yourself from that and go to a new place and go off grid and like just get rid of those voices that are just pounding your head, that's when you get to rediscover who you are and what you stand up for, mm -hmm. what you're willing to fight for, mm -hmm. and the people in the world that you plan to preserve going forward. Now, Hannah, you have done some international traveling as well. You've been to Botswana. Mm -hmm. And tell, tell us a little bit about your experience there. I personally haven't been, so I would love to hear you know your reflections on that experience. My trip to Botswana was life-changing, just like you said. It, it changed everything for me, and getting to meet some of the most wonderful people was what made the trip on top of the wonderful hunting and the experience of all of that. But the climate in Arizona where I'm from and the climates in Botswana are actually really similar. Oh, that's nice. And so we had some people that had come from Botswana to learn how to make water catchments mm -hmm. and learn about how we deal with our water shortage. And I got to be involved with that and got to meet some re really wonderful people from Botswana. And they told me, hey, if we ever open up hunting again, you need to be here. Mm -hmm. And I took full advantage of that. And as soon as they opened up hunting, I, I brought my bow. And I actually didn't end up hunting with a professional hunter. I hunted with some locals and a game warden, which was some of the most stressful things I could have ever yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> but it was incredible because it was people that really needed the meat. I got to provide them with things that they needed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them had never seen bow hunting in, yes. in their whole lives. So they were amazed by it and it was so fun to work with them and teach them and learn from them and it was such a good relationship that we built with them and it was kind of funny they actually came to me at the end and they said hey are there any shooting competitions at home for your bow and I said yeah yeah there's definitely some and they said you should enter all of them you'll win and I said no I'm really not that good you guys just haven't seen anyone else at bow hunts. but yeah wonderful people like Shay, Shay said and just amazing amazing experience I have been so honored to be able to meet people that mm -hmm. I never would have met other than that and yeah. to be able to provide them food was everything and it meant so much to me to be able to help someone that ne really needed it. Yeah being a young hunter and a provider um, it's it's definitely a feeling of accomplishment and it gives you a lot of pride when you know you're contributing to the well-being of your family or you know in some cases you know you're you're contributing to the well-being of a of a whole community or a larger part of a society and that's what i think a lot of um, people really misunderstand about international hunting especially when it comes to hunting anywhere in the continent of africa um, anytime i post a, a white-tailed deer I, I don't get commentary but when i post a photo of a sable mm -hmm. or um, a kudu or any any other you know african species that you might be hunting people really misunderstand the utilization of that animal and how hunters are are taking that and we're taking it off the mountain we're feeding communities with it we're feeding the people that work um, the preserves where we're hunting we're feeding the entire community as large and then like even the bones are used what nothing I was, wasted <laughs> nothing wasted i was so surprised um you know, here in the U.S., it's, you know, nobody, for the most part, really uses bones. I mean, sometimes we'll make bone marrow broths or things like that. But by and large, I think the bones are something that's just kind of discarded. Yeah. There, the bones are ground and they use them uh, for feed for cattle. And then they also use them for fertilizer. Yeah. And so it, everything is consumptive there. Um, and I f really feel like COVID-19 especially affected a lot of the poorer communities because without the influx of hunters coming in um, the supply chain for that that naturally harvested meat was really cut short um, and so we're real I'm you know I'm very thankful that I continued to travel and was able to continue to provide for that have you ladies done any donating locally in the United States to food banks with your harvests or done any projects or stewardship in that capacity in the US yeah, um, within the United States, I've done a lot of hunting where I take my own meat back, which is like yeah. really great. I, I, I haven't eaten a farmed animal and I couldn't even tell you how yeah. long, um, which I have an agriculture background, so I'm totally for that as well. But um, whenever I don't bring meat back, what tends to happen a lot of times if you talk to outfitters, um, they either know someone in need or mm -hmm. they 
the butcher or the processor that you take it to um, can use that meat and um, mix it or resell it depending on regulations yeah. and stuff um, or use it themselves and yeah. so there's always a person in need, whether in the United States like or in Africa. Right? I got to go to Africa this last year and I got to see that supply chain issue and what people were and were not being able to get, mm -hmm. which is a, a major problem. Um, and so there's always people in need. If you just look up and look around you, whatever meat you don't take back, there's always someone there willing um, to take some. And giving away to my friends, like even just here in my hometown, mm -hmm. um, getting like their first bite of like a bison burger or something yeah. like that it's so fun to watch him experience mm -hmm. that and be like wow this tastes good i'm like yeah i told you <laughs> you're I, like I, be, I don't hunt for no reason yeah i know <laughs> people ask me oh i don't like hunting and i'm like well that's okay i like eating meat yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so i just choose to do my own harvesting and that's something i as a woman i'm very proud of and and, and proud to be part of there's a lot of great donation areas um, hunters for hungry is one of them that yeah. the nra is a huge proponent of and a lot of times if you talk to a local butcher i do a lot of meat donation because i travel and i hunt a lot and they're you know like this year for my white tail is my favorite so i had some white tail deer processed and i took it home but i also had a family that they have a, a lot of children and, and they go through a lot of meat and with with inflation right now and food prices and, and grocery prices going through the roof there's a lot of people that can't afford quality meals right here in the United States. So as a hunter, it's really valuable to be able to contribute to that. In the state of Wyoming, um, they have, <clears throat> sorry. In the state of Wyoming, they have a program that the governor, uh, Jenny Gordon, introduced called Share the Harvest. And that's where they take, you know, harvested meat in the state of Wyoming and they use that and they process it and donate it to family in need. Um, and I believe their their average statistic is, is over two pounds a day that's going out and going to local people because there truly is a need, especially as prices increase. Um, everything gets a little bit harder in the world and it's nice for us as young women, um, you as young women, me as, a woman. <laughs> it's nice for us to be able to contribute back to uh, our society as a whole and, and really be a part of sustaining a healthier lifestyle. There's definitely so. a unique connection that comes with that too and yeah I got to donate a deer to that Wyoming program um, as well so it, it's pretty cool being able to see exactly where it goes. Mm -hmm. I think on top of that being able to take the meat that you harvested and that you worked for and share it with people that don't hunt mm -hmm. is such a powerful thing and I am so passionate about it. We eat everything. I mean, we eat javelina. I don't know if y'all have ever <laughs> harvested a javelina. I have not, but, but I love wild pig. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we've made it like a, a ritual in our family that every year we're hunting pigs because I love pig. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they have a scent gland and they're smelly, and the, but they're so fun to hunt. Mm -hmm. And I will not harvest anything without knowing that I'm going to eat it. So mm -hmm. I'm very passionate about it. I'll make javelina tacos and I'll bring my friends over. The rise in participation of women and kids in both hunting and shooting sports has encouraged firearms manufacturers to produce rifles that offer out-of-the-box adjustability. One of the many reasons that I love Ruger firearms is that they manufacture rifles for everyone. Many models like this Ruger Hawkeye Long Range Hunter feature spacers that can be easily added or removed from the buttstock of the rifle, providing a comfortable fit and ease of use for all responsible citizens. I'm a proud Ruger American, and you should be too. But um, being at Northern Arizona University, a lot of the people that I became very close with and very good friends with, when I first met them, they were anti-hunters. Mm -hmm. And they had no idea, they didn't know anything about it. A lot of them didn't even really think that we ate the stuff that we harvested. Yeah. And so it was always a huge thing to me to bring these people to my house and say, hey, we're having taco night, guess what it is? And they enjoyed it and they it's loved it. It's mystery meat yes. night. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not your mom's meatloaf, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> but we had so much fun with it. And I really got to make these awesome relationships with these people who before they knew me, they hated hunting. Yeah. And they had no idea what it meant and how much we work for it. And being able to change that perspective is such a huge thing as well. So giving back, it definitely matters. And I'm very grateful to be able to do that too but but 
for furthering hunting and be able to help out with that too, that is everything as well. I think one of the first questions I get from some of my non-hunting friends when they see that um, I've hunted an animal is like, oh, did you get to eat it? Mm -hmm. And it's so fun when almost every single time I get to say, yeah, like even if it's an international animal, um, normally whoever you hunt it with will help you process it fast enough to be able to try it before you leave. Yeah. And so that's been so fun too. Um, it's just great when you get to that, like that satisfaction of being like, yeah, I eat it. Like and that's what we do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> On top of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think everybody should try almost everything. There are some things that I have not eaten. <laughs> I have not eaten a bobcat yet. Um, but I'm I'm sure it's edible. Yeah. <laughs> Predator animal, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, and I have not eaten coyote. <laughs> I think I'll avoid that one too. But um, for the most part, I think hunters are very, um, very good and gracious that way. I eat mountain lion. I eat black bear. You know, all of these animals that a lot of people think, oh, you can't eat that. And then it's like, well, why can't you? Um, it might not be traditional to eat them, but you can eat everything, really. Um, it's all consumptive. Uh, so... Let's take this into, you know, you ladies are extraordinary mentors and, um, you know, Shay, you have a tremendous agriculture background. So you're, you grew up a family farmer. You guys raised crops like corn. Now you're raising pistachios. You've, you guys have uh, raised livestock for, for beef, for, for meat, for grocery stores and things like that. In your community, you know, do you have a lot of friends that aren't hunters and how do you how do you bridge the gap with your friends? How do you talk to them? What are what are some things that you know you 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 know lend them as far as how hunting is conservation? Yeah, um, I'd say the region I grew up in, thankfully, were not a lot of anti-hunters, just a lot of non-hunters. And so when you're approaching that kind of situation, the first thing I always do is first like build a relationship with that person, mm -hmm. right? Throwing the fact that you're a hunter and I've gone and done this and I've shot this and all that stuff, that's not the way to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always building that relationship with that person and getting their trust first. You want to come across as someone with values, someone who takes care of themselves, loves the people around you, loves the world that you live in, um, and has the desire to give and um, be a good person. And then when it comes up, um, and if you're into it enough, it always comes up eventually, <laughs> um, then normally people might be a little bit surprised at first. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, like, you and if, if you see me I'm, I'm a 5 4 18 year old like there's not much intimidation about me um and normally if i meet someone off the street the first initial reaction is not going to be that i'm some big tough hunter gal going around yeah. shooting guns you know what i mean like that, that, that's just not what i look like if we You're just face the facts when, the stereotypical, stereotypical yeah stereotypical american might consider to be a hunter right? yeah exactly you, exactly you're, you're, you're on the fringe of that yeah so i think i have kind of like the edge where when people find out they're surprised yeah. and and so like, their immediate reaction isn't to criticize, it's to ask. And, um, and so I think I'm blessed with that. But definitely, yeah, just like building that relationship first. And then when it comes to it, acknowledge first the fact that there's a reason I go out and do this. Mm -hmm. And it's more than just to boost my own ego. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I'm honest and I'm transparent about what I do and why I do it. I, I don't use, I guess, like vulgar or like... I don't know, like bloody language or whatever, mm -hmm. but I'm also not hiding what I do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much the approach I take. How do you handle it, Hannah? Well, I also, I grew up in a really small kind of agriculture based town. And so I didn't really get a lot of that growing up when I was younger. But when I did start to get into college and I went to a college where a lot of people are kind of fate focused on the environmental side of things, but from a different standpoint than yeah. hunters, I really was kind of thrown into it and I learned really fast. The first friend I made actually in college was, she's a vegan and she doesn't hunt and she was super against it when we first met and she was my first friend. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like what you were saying, Shay, we made that relationship first and she was surprised too because everyone has this image of what a hunter is and breaking that mold is mind-blowing to yeah. people a lot of times but I'm very proud to do it I'm very happy to do it and I'm very proud to see other people doing it yeah same here yeah but <laughs> um I sat down and I talked to her and I said this is what we do this is how hard we work for what we do and 
we actually have a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. The way that you care about animals are also the way that hunters care about animals. Yeah. The stuff that you value, the conservation that you value, all of the things that you value are a lot of the stuff that we have in common. Mm -hmm. And so establishing that middle ground and the fact that we have a lot more in common than we don't mm -hmm. was the biggest thing that I could ever do. And it's so important. It's hard to do sometimes, mm -hmm. especially I think as we grow more divided mm -hmm. in society. But being able to look at each other and say, hey, we've actually deep down value the same thing. We just do it differently was very, very successful to me and very helpful in furthering hunting and making relationships with people that I never thought I might have relationships with. And I know they surely did not expect to ever be best friends with a hunter, but yeah. it's important being able to make those conversations and, and have those hard talks mm -hmm. with people is very important and it's what's going to continue on the future of hunting. Yeah, I think, I think it's most I think it's safe to say that most school curriculums leave out that the North American model of wildlife conservation which is the backbone of conservation throughout the world and it's the most successful model of conservation was spearheaded implemented and is currently funded by hunters people don't a lot of people don't realize that it's not taught in schools so when you hear hunter you automatically think a negative connotation if if you're not within the hunting community because you don't know or th maybe they weren't taught that hunting truly is conservation and they say well how can you say hunting is conservation when you're killing animals well license and tag sales in, in every single state is equates to 75% of individual state uh, budgets. And then we take um, the Pittman-Robertson Act, which is a self-imposed excise tax uh, that firearms manufacturers, ammunition manufacturers, archery manufacturers, they pay. That goes into the con con uh, conservation fund throughout um, the United States. Those PR dollars are the, the driving force and the workforce of funding for conservation principles. But then we also have this great thing called free market principles. Yeah. <laughs> and the free market does more for conservation than any other market. So you have, you know, shooting sports enthusiasts and hunters that are paying an excise tax on the manufacturing side. We're paying for conservation in our statewide tag sales, but then we give again to organizations like Safari Club with donations, with with everything that we're doing in this room to generate revenue for conservation programs where states need a little help you know like you're in arizona you you're doing a lot with elk and water uh, water projects you're helping restore elk to different parts of the united states that weren't there historically that takes funding and hunters are are putting putting the money out there to to help habitat and to help wildlife yeah, hunters are the backbone of conservation and it's something that is definitely ignored a lot of times. I definitely found a lot of value in talking to people about that, mm -hmm. but a lot of people are like, okay, you have money, okay. But another way that we really worked on establishing credibility with people outside of that as well is just sitting there and talking about Hunters not only care by giving their dollar, they care about knowledge, they care about knowing, they know more about the wildlife they pursue than most people yeah. will ever learn about mm -hmm. wildlife. And being at NAU and studying environmental policy, I was in a lot of classes where all of these people, their worlds revolved around saving the planet and all of these things that they were so passionate about. And but I actually, were, those, were those students out on the ground actually helping restorative projects yeah. in the same capacity that you as a hunter were. Well, that's what I'm saying. Here they they weren't. And mm -hmm. a lot of them had no idea what they were actually fighting to protect. So I would be in the middle of a class and we actually had one professor ask us several questions and we were talking about the disconnect with the natural world and how big of a deal that was and everyone was very upset about it. And so she said, okay, well, we're going to go through this list and see what you guys know. Because this is what you're studying. This is what you do. This is what you're passionate about. And she walked through a list like, when do elk rut? They had when, no idea. Yeah. The class was silent. Nobody knew except for me. And it was really incredible because everyone in the class knew I was a hunter. I, I had talked about it, especially in a class that's about outdoor policy. It was important that we were having those conversations. 
So everyone knew I was a hunter, and she went down this list about all these different things, like when do when do mule deer rut? When does this happen? When does this happen? And nobody knew the answer except for me. And that was a very powerful moment, and you felt a shift in the room on how people viewed me. Mm -hmm. And I had talked a lot about the money that we give, but the time that we give and the energy that we give and the knowledge that we have is a very, very val valuable tool mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Just what you said right there. <laughs>Hey everyone, after successfully using Rack One Big Game Peanut Butter and their super yummy PB&J in my spring bear baits, I'm really excited to share with you guys two new premium bear attractants from Rack One. One is Picnic Basket and the other one is Jelly Donut Flavors. Like every good Picnic Basket, this tantalizing blend contains a variety of irresistible snacks and treats to whet the appetite of any and all bears that come within range of its powerful, alluring aroma. The carefully blended mix of fruits and nuts and other secret ingredients put out a picnic spread and long distance scent trail that'll have the big fellows inviting themselves over to a party. I think it's safe to say that we all love donuts and that bears will also love to wake up to a yummy donut. Rack One's Jelly Donut is an aromatic mix of fruits and nuts blended with Rack One's secret ingredients formulated to lure bears in where you want them. The aroma is intense and nose catching even at long distance and will send the snack signal far downwind. All the Rack One flavors are sure to lure them in and can be placed wisely near trail cameras or your hunting stand. The rest is easy. All you have to do is make the shot. Post graduation, you know, Hannah, you're talking a lot about um, you're talking a lot about policy. You're working for Congressional Sportsman's Foundation now. Tell everybody a little bit about the fight that you're in on the policy side to help ensure the rights for hunters. It's been a really amazing job, and I knew. The I always knew that I wanted to be involved in furthering hunting and protecting our time-honored traditions and I never really knew how I would end up doing that but after I graduated college in May I ended up kind of getting recruited for a job with the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation and they reached out to me and I do a lot more of the communication side of things about mm -hmm. what we do so perfect question for me Christy oh, yeah. <laughs> but I am thrilled to be working for them they do a lot of good stuff we actually work really really closely with SCI to help protect all of the things that we care about but we work in our, our capitals and we work on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. to really work directly with the policy to make sure that we are furthering not only conservation priorities but hunting priorities fishing priorities and trapping priorities absolutely so NRA National Rifle Association and Safari Club International and Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, they work extremely closely together. Um, NRA is a powerhouse in Washington, D.C. in ensuring the right for us to hunt and fish. And they, they do a lot for access. They do a lot for legislation. Safari Club International is one of, was besides Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, is the only one with a political action committee that's based in Washington, D.C. So they have their, their staff on the pulse of legislation before it becomes enacted, you know, lobbying on the rights of hunters, on behalf of hunters, on behalf of conservation. And so we're very fortunate to have both the NRA, Congressional, and SCI in Washington, D.C. on our behalf. If, if you guys are all watching this or listening and you're not members of any of those organizations, you need to be. Um, because it's it's very important to ensure our rights and and we don't have rights unless we have them protected in courts and the NRA has done a really great job of trying to establish case law that supports uh, science-based wildlife management and, and we're trying to really fight animal personhood. You know, can you imagine like bald eagle versus state of California? That's what some of the animal rights activists are trying to do where animals or animal rights activists can actually sue states on behalf of an animal, which is, you know, animal welfare, animal rights, very different things. So having the correct vocabulary implemented, 
in front of our policymakers, in front of our decision makers is, is so important right now. And, um, you know, Shay, you're still in college. You're kind of up and coming, but you have big goals to helping this in the future. You know, let us know, like, how are you planning on or what are you hoping to do to, you know, help the fight for hunting? Yeah. I've been involved with SCI, GSCO, a lot of um, these other, and NRA a little bit as well, yeah. um, organizations. And um, I guess I'll start off with saying, like, even if you're, like, sounds scary to, like, jump in on this, there's a place for everybody. Absolutely. Um, however you feel like you are willing to contribute, there is something that you can help with. And that's kind of the approach that I took when I jumped into this. And um, I started going to these SCI conventions, oh, geez, I think maybe four or five years ago mm -hmm. and so that put me like what 13 14 years old and um you're a baby that's, good. that's, good. <laughs> now, that's what we need here though I mean, we need young people coming here yeah and and that's what i found is i found like okay these are a bunch of people that really care about this thing that mm -hmm. i care about and that is that's so cool and it, it got me excited and immediately i began talking to um some of the board members who work here some big um supporters some founders um stuff like that and people and they helped me find a place where I could help at my stage, my age, what it was. And they actually got me excited about this thing to applying for this award. Mm -hmm. What I do now is I serve on my local chapters, um, board of directors. Mm -hmm. I'm the junior membership chair, and I also run um, our social media accounts um, and just assist in whatever other like little jobs I need to help out in. Um, when it comes to International Safari Club International, um, as a larger organization, I have been pushing um, to help with more engagement in our generation, mm -hmm. um, our age people, and just see a lot of experimenting, throwing out ideas, brainstorming. Um, but pretty soon, and as I meet more people who are on the same page, I think big stuff and actual permanent things are going to begin happening right now. And that's something that I don't plan on stopping on doing. Um, as I learn more about this organization, about our world, the skills and talents that even I have personally, we're going to be doing some good big stuff so give our audience I mean this is the question of of the future of hunting how do we get more young people involved what what do what are we doing wrong like you know I'm in I'm middle-aged you're in your 20s and then we have a lot of members here that are you know 60 plus years old there's I don't know necessarily how to communicate with 20 year olds or 10 year olds and you know, how, how do we communicate to these younger people to where we can get some 13 year olds in here and fire them up for conservation? How can we help get a 20 year old in here and fire them up for conservation? I think this award is actually responsible for doing a lot of that. It not only kind of gives a place for a young hunter to be a leader in the hunting industry and in the outdoor world, but it also changes the face of what a hunter is. I mean, yeah. look at Che and I here today. It's and awesome. Me, yeah, me. mostly yeah. Christy. No. <laughs> but, we don't but, look like your average hunter, no. right? <laughs> Quote unquote average hunter. But breaking the mold is huge. Like I said, I didn't know any women that hunted, mm -hmm. so I had no idea. I didn't know if I wanted to do it because mm -hmm. I didn't know anyone that did it. And being able to break the mold and people will buy into things mm -hmm. that they feel like yeah. represent them. So yeah. changing what a hunter is and yeah. redefining what we are would be huge and being able to say, hey, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Hey, it doesn't matter what you look like or who you are, or where, what your background is from, you are capable and there are other people out here doing that. And this award and SEI and congressional sportsmen do a really great job of pushing that R3 and kind of changing the face of what matters and who we are as hunters. Oh, I love that. Amen. Yes. For sure. I think our generation especially is looking for something to fight for in a real way. I think a lot of us um, are over the whole conceptual, let's try and help everybody out kind of ideal. I think we're looking for something that we get to see and be involved in and know that we're making a difference. Um, and I think we need to be able to help our people find that place and if that's you know what their world ends up coming into or if it's just like a little side thing that they're interested in it's um again finding that place because everybody has a role that they can play here mm -hmm. and um everybody from all different countries are coming here it's really a beautiful thing mm -hmm. yeah i totally agree and i think that it, it is a welcoming space um and everybody is welcome here and there is a role in politics for everyone whether you're getting involved with your local school board whether you're volunteering for a chapter there's a lot of people out there like okay i'm young i don't hunt my parents don't hunt 
I don't even know where to start. Um, my recommendation for a lot of those young people is get involved in a nonprofit, like a Safari Club chapter. You know, we have over 170 chapters across the country that are really a grassroots opportunities for people to connect with people that, that love hunting in their, in their community. Um, they, they're always doing outreach projects locally with, with hunting. Um, Shoot, even if it's just to fulfill your required volunteer graduation hours. Exactly. Like we, Take a kid hunting. Yeah, yeah. Take a, kid <laughs> Take a kid hunting, get them involved in land stewardship projects, all of these things that really reconnect you. And I think being reconnected to the ground is so important, especially with COVID. You know, we were all kind of confined over the last couple of years and being able to get out and breathe fresh air and have those experiences where we weren't, you know, stuffed into a face mask <laughs> six feet apart from people in in recycled air i think it made us all really grow in appreciation and valuation for wild landscapes and and that is that's something that i think any age person not only can appreciate but um uh values more than ever that's very true and kind of going back to what hannah said earlier a lot of people have the same end goal we just have different ways and different perspectives on how to get there. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as we can create this massive community of wanting to preserve our lands and preserve our wildlife and preserve our rights, if we can keep those three things mm -hmm. in value with each other, mm -hmm. the ways that we maybe get there could be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But as long as we agree to work cooperatively, cooperatively together and acknowledge each other's differences, but still try and find that end goal, that's where I think real possibilities are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I 100% I agree with you, Shay. As much a, as an importance as it has to make those connections with people who don't hunt, mm -hmm. it's also really important for hunters and it's something that we struggle with. Mm -hmm. We think, hey, they, they shoot upland birds, they don't get what I get, or they don't get what I get mm -hmm. because they only hunt mule deer out west. We have the same goal. We mm -hmm. all want to protect what we care about. Mm -hmm. And even though we do it differently and we don't always have the same understanding of things, we have the same goal. We need to have the conversations with each other. And we need to start off by understanding that the roots are the same. Mm -hmm. The roots of all of us are the same and the passions of all of us are the same. And no matter how differently we do it, we need to be able to have those conversations and, and make that connection with each other. Let's talk a little bit about social media, because for a young person, social media is everything. I mean, I think the average kid spends 90% of their life looking at a phone, which is tragic. Ouch. Um, instead of looking up and yeah. out and experiencing the world, we have a lot of this in-face frenzy going on. How do you ladies manage your social media accounts, and how do you both try to portray hunting to your peers? I have definitely focused in on the storytelling aspect of hunting. I want to share the stuff outside of shooting an animal. Like like we've talked about today, I, hunting is not just shooting an animal. Hunting is meeting people and making stories and learning about what sagebrush is and why it's there and what animals eat what and just having that information and that experience is so important and hunting is not only about that mm -hmm. so being able to tell the story of what hunting is and and share what we are and the basis of what we are is really important as mm -hmm. well i actually i've gotten several death threats on instagram mm -hmm. and i've got my fair share of it and just like you said it's it's never a meal deer it's mm -hmm. always the things that people see in zoos and they have these like idealized pictures of these animals in their head uh, that they aren't actually wild animals yeah. and I actually shot a bear when I was 17 and woke up to thousands of death threats over it mm -hmm. and it's interesting and it's sad because I think it's scary that somebody could possibly be turned away from hunting over something like that. So, How did you handle that? Well there are some people that you will be able to talk to and there are some people that will have middle ground with you and then there are some people that you will just never find middle ground mm -hmm. with so i definitely kind of withdrew from being it from reading the comments because what good does that do me yeah. i know who i am i know what i care about and i know the good that i do so being able to be strong in myself enough to not let that bother me was huge but i do think back to somebody who was younger or even just a younger me if i would have gotten all of that when i was eight what would the response have been? Mm -hmm. And one thing that was very, very helpful to me 
is when it comes down to it, the roots of us are the same with hunters mm -hmm. and people really had my back. And I, as many messages as I got that were death threats, I got a lot of messages of people that were like, hey, I support you because we care about the same things. Even some people that weren't hunters understood that what we did was good and what we cared about was good. And being able to tell that story to the right people, it mattered and it yeah. made a difference. And having that support was everything. So I cannot stress enough the importance of having each other's backs as hunters because it may make the difference between a young woman hunting and stopping hunting yeah. over something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I take pretty much two, um, or I focus on two main things when it comes to how I manage my social media. One is that in all reality, most of my followers are friends of mine I've met throughout my time hunting and they just want to stay updated on my mm -hmm. life and what I'm up to. My second approach is that I live this big, glorious life that I love that involves hunting, but it also involves traveling just without hunting. Um, you know, I've within friends and family all over the world, I've been to many places and not taken a gun. Um, or if it's just hiking in the mountains close to my house or whatever it is, my life is one big grand adventure is like the way that I look at it. And hunting just happens to be one part of it that I really, really like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so incorporating this as part of me and part of my lifestyle, part of my life as a whole, it's it merges a lot of people's interests together um, and portrays hunting in a light that is one of respect, one of um, honor to the animals and to the wildlife around us. Um, so that's pretty much the two things that I focus on. I thankfully haven't gotten as many negative comments as you have of course I've gotten a few um, you, you really can't get away from it but again it's like staying true to yourself and just recognizing what you value most absolutely having that strength in yourself is so important and I understand what what you're saying about sharing the stuff outside of hunting because it's so true like a picture is worth a thousand words we've heard that a billion times and a grip and grin you know I I take them absolutely I take them too but Telling the story of hunting outside of the killing part of hunting is huge. Mm -hmm. Going into a canyon, backpacking into a canyon and taking a photo, eating a mountain house in the middle of a canyon in Idaho, mm -hmm. or just taking a photo of glassing, talking about the mule deer rut, talking about different stuff, holding up a shed that you found. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff is hunting. All of it is hunting. It's the basis of hunting. Yes. It's the work of hunting and sharing that story outside of just the parts of it that that we know and we love as well is huge as well, I believe. Safari Club International has an interesting social media campaign called Hunt the Facts. And it's, it's designed to be educational infographics that they post on their pages that kind of combat the negative narrative that can be attached with hunting. And that's been a tremendous resource. And what I have found personally if and when I've had a, somebody that's an anti-hunter or, or just somebody who's on just misunderstanding hunting completely, when they attack me, I, I give them facts. I, I, re, I relay back to the North American model of wildlife conservation. I look at science-based wildlife management principles, and I give them real information um, that helps them hopefully see a different light. And I have found every time I do that, that the anti-male, the hate, the hate messages when when they don't have an argument when you put it back and say look you may not like what I'm doing but the fact of the matter is and then you state out you know uh, facts about Pittman Robertson dollars or license and tag sales and where that money is going and then you then you give them a question back and you say well what have you done yeah I have funded this I volunteered my time I work with these nonprofits these are the things I'm on the ground doing maybe not every day but all year long um, throughout the year what are you doing? And nobody likes the light casted on, upon themselves when they're throwing stones. And it, it seems to me it's been a very effective practice. If I, Shine a positive light on yourself and reflect back to them, what are you doing to make a difference? And a lot of times they don't have anything that they're doing. They're just using words to bully, degrade, demean, belittle our movement, which is is a tried and true uh, movement that is, you know, the first we're the first crusaders in conservation, and so I, I think it's very important that you know we have broad shoulders on social media. We remain proud of what we're doing, and, and we we really enjoy the fact that hunting truly is conservation, and that we're stewards to the land. 
going back to like we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't care mm -hmm. we wouldn't be sacrificing our stuff our time our money everything yeah. if we didn't care mm -hmm. so that, that's really what we're here for yeah absolutely having those conversations is really important and sharing the benefits of what we do is really important and i actually found it to be really valuable as well to talk to people and say hey you know you you cannot like what we do but you are lucky to have us mm -hmm. because this is what we do and these are the benefits of what we do mm -hmm. and being able to have those conversations a lot of people took them well and the people that were so polarized that they were sending death threats we were never going to get to them anyways yeah. and so having those conversations are so important and being able to say you know you you cannot like me you cannot like what i do but but you're blessed. You're you're lucky to have a hunter. You're right. lucky to have hunters that spend that much money and that much time yeah. and that much resources to help save the things that you care about. And every time you lace up your hiking boots and you enjoy our public lands, thank, thank a, a hunter. hunter. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, and yesterday, um, I had the privilege of, of talk, sitting down and talking with uh, David Bernhardt, our, our uh, former Secretary of Interior during the Trump administration. And you know they had worked very hard to um, pass the Great American Outdoors Act. And, and they have done a lot of really great policy um, to ensure that we have wild places that are protected and, and available for us to use as resources. And um, I'm really thankful for the work they did. Their, the, the Biden administration has kind of moved away from some of that, um, and they're they're looking at shutting down some access to hunting. So Safari Club International is working really hard, um, and we have a no net loss petition um, that we are trying to get a lot of signatures on because we're really trying to encourage the Biden administration to not uh, enact an, a net loss for access for hunting. So um, it's something that we're working really hard on and we're very active in. So if all of you haven't signed that petition, please do add your name to that. It's really important. These ladies are prime examples of how you can get involved and truly shape the future of our country at any age. And I, it is such an honor for me and it's so inspirational for me to sit down with both of you um, to see the two of you, it, it, you know, it just gives so much hope that uh, the next generation of wildlife is going to be benefited because of you. And, and in my speech tonight, I, I talk about how I open it with um, how we do not inherit this land from our ancestor, ancestors. We borrow it from the next generation. And I have borrowed the land from you, and I hope that I leave it in a better place for you to enjoy than when you were born. And you ladies are, are going to be doing the same thing for the next generation. And, and the goal in this room is that that torch never fades and that torch never dies and that we keep handing it off. And um, it is truly an honor to be here with both of you. Ladies, thank you for joining us here. Um, anything else that you want to contribute to this conservation? It's a great perspective. I guess my one last thing I'd like to ask for those who might not know it, where can we find that petition to sign it? It's on the SCI website. So just go to safariclub.org and it will be in there. It's the no net loss petition and it's it's right on the homepage. It's easy to find. Perfect. I Everyone just want to say it. thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. And I I know Shay probably feels the same way. I feel so honored to be receiving this award. And uh, if there's anything I can ask you is get involved, mm -hmm. be involved. Don't put your head down and act like things aren't happening mm -hmm. around you and take a kid hunting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this. This is a topic we both care a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, so we're super honored that we get to be able to be representatives and stewards of this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll just close it out with one last thing. There's power in the purse, meaning how we spend our money, where we spend our money, where we spend our time um, gives power. And Cabela's and Bass Pro sponsored this award for you ladies. They're a big supporter of the next generation. And so when you go to buy something at retail, think about those people that are exhibiting in this room. Think about those companies that are a part of what we're doing because those are the people that are really here fighting for you guys. Um, they're here supporting you. So look around and, and make your decisions based off the people that are supporting our values. And, and that's where we want to spend our money and our time and, and serve our resources um, from our time standpoint, mental standpoint, and, and give those companies back you know, what they're giving us by, by just simply even being here. So Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast from the SCI convention in Las Vegas, and we are celebrating 50 years of conservation and SCI being first for hunters. So thank you ladies for joining me. Thank, thank you for you. having us, Christy. All right, that's a wrap. Yay. Cool. Woo. Good job. Okay. That was so much fun. That was great. <laughs>
Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram. 